So we're starting this new sermon series, Hear Her Roar, a biblically informed discussion on womanhood, week one. And I want to welcome a lot of you uh, who aren't here today or watching online, so I want to welcome you as well uh, to this service. Um, I want to pray because I believe this to be uh, a message that is going to be impactful and going to shape our worldview uh, in ways that our worldview needs to be shaped. And here's the theme of my prayer, and that is Romans 12. It says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. What we think impacts how we live. So let me pray that God might move among us today. Let's pray. God, we're going to talk about over the next six weeks, um, as you know, God, we're going to talk about uh, issues, topics uh, that are dear to your heart and are super controversial uh, in today's culture. Um, God, would you bring thoughtfulness and compassion and, and, and reasoning to our, our discussion over the next six weeks? Would you lead and direct us that we might be a more uh, compassionate people in this world, in this culture that we live in? Would you move in and among us? Holy Spirit, you're welcome here today. Would you, would you, uh, we know you're here. Would you make us aware of, make us aware of your presence? We pray this in the strong and mighty and able name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The jumping off point today, where I want to begin this series, is I want us to realize culture's definition of a human being, what it means to be a person, because you may have bought into this wholeheartedly. Uh, I want to I want to introduce this thought with a with a quote by Dr. Dallas Willard. He's dead now, but if you if you haven't, you should read. You should you should study some of Dr. Dallas Willard's uh, thoughts, his writings. He was a great Christian philosopher. Here's what he says: the fundamental the fundamental reality on the teaching that prevails in our culture is the physical world. A few months ago when I was preaching through Colossians, I showed you this quote. I want to unpack it a bit more now. The fundamental reality on the teaching that prevails in our culture is the physical world. What does that mean? The idea behind this quote is that, that in the culture that we live in, nationally and really globally, existence, reality, lies almost exclusively, if not exclusively, in the physical world. So in other words, we define ourselves largely according to the physical and nothing else. Said another way, you are, by definition, your physical self, your body. What you, what you take in, the, the input and, and and your, your output, that defines you as a person. So your appearance, your, your physical existence, all of that makes up the sum total of who you are. It's no wonder many of us spend so much time working on our body. Going to the gym, watching what we eat, educating our brains because our, our, our gray matter, that, that's part of the physical reality of who we are, sometimes surgically altering our bodies to, because that is who we are. That is the sum total. That is the definition of you. We humans think of ourselves almost exclusively in physical terms. I'll give you an example uh, one of the only ways that we know how to recognize someone um, in a public fashion, uh, in a legal fashion, would be this controversial technique, uh, 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 facial recognition, uh, computer software. Uh, the, the ability to see a face and determine that is uniquely you, facial recognition. It's one example of how we don't have really any other way of defining individually the human being other than the physical realm. 
We, the human race, think of ourselves almost exclusively in terms of blood and guts and bone structure and DNA and your parents' genes, your brain. Apart from that, we have trouble defining you from me, me from someone else. It's no wonder we haven't solved problems like race and gender and tribalism and nationalism because we differentiate one from another according to how we look, according to the physical. So working out to, to care for your body, going to the gym three, four times a week and working out to care for your soul becomes working out for other people to define yourself in the eyes of other people the way that you want them to see you. How we view food and how we view clothing and how you view yourself as a sexual being and, and how we view uh, our mental ability to pass a test, to get a degree, all these issues come to define us, the physical realm. It is no wonder that decades into life, we become introspective and say, I don't even think I know myself. Certainly other people don't know the real me, because all they know of me is what they see. Now, there is a different camp that, that defines personhood in a different fashion. There is a Christian ethic. In fact, this is a, a Judeo-Christian ethic. It has lasted as long as God has been interacting with humankind. The Old Testament, the New Testament. There is this Christian ethic which says that, that we are defined in this way. We are spiritual beings. We're not first and foremost physical we are first and foremost spiritual. And I want to give you a definition of spirit. I've always, I've always struggled with what a spirit is. If you are a spiritual being, you have a spirit. Here is the definition. Um, Dallas Willard s speaks into this. Uh, Wayne Grudem speaks into this. Other theologians have spoken into this, this definition, so I'm probably robbing from some other really brilliant men, but I don't think they would mind. A definition of spirit. You are spirit in nature. The definition of spirit is unbodily personal power. I, I could say immaterial. I don't really like that word uh, as much as unbodily, but I, this, this, this needs to uh, be explained a bit. You are, every one of you, you individually, your personhood, you are a spirit, you are unbodily personal power. In other words, your spirit is not subservient to your body. Said another way, one day your body will fail you. It's probably already beginning to do so even now. You one day will slough off this body, shed this body, and your spirit will continue to thrive for eternity as a power. But not just some nebulous, universal force. You are a person. You are a person, personal power, and your spirit, personal power, and, and, and you will exist for eternity. Again, your spirit is not subservient to your body. Jesus... He went to a well one day, and a Samaritan woman was there, and he engaged her in conversation. And we're going to talk more about his conversation with 
that lady later on in today's sermon and in coming weeks. But for now, let's just, let's just briefly talk about the, the dialogue he had. Jesus said to this Samaritan woman at the well, he said, God is spirit. You can look it up later. It's John chapter 4. Jesus said, God is spirit. He went on, he said, and those who worship God, worship God in spirit and in truth. God is person. God is a person. God does not have a body. Now, Jesus came, Jesus had a body, but, but God, for eternity, prior to Jesus coming to the earth, God had no body. But he is much more than just some nebulous, universal power. God is a person. The personhood of God. He is a spirit. Unbodily personal power. Now, by culture's definition of reality, there is no God. And you may, you may struggle with that, with that concept yourself because if we believe that that, that, that humanity mostly is divine, defined by, the, in the physical way, the physical manner, then God does not exist because God has no body. By the way, by culture's definition, you don't exist either. If, in fact, what I'm saying is true, that, that we are first and foremost spirit. If you are buying into culture's definition of what it means to be human, then you are nothing more than your physique, your split time, your fastest lap, your bench press, your dress size, your work, your output, your GPA, your SAT, your GED, maybe your IRA. That's all you are if you define yourself in merely physical terms. Well, we, here are, we are here today because we are interested in the spiritual world, right? That's probably why you're here today. And so you probably embrace the fact that, yes, God exists in spirit. The fact that he doesn't have a physical body doesn't make him any less a reality. And I exist as a spirit, as an unbodily personal power for eternity, a person. I have a wife, as you know, I have two daughters, as most of you know, and the meaning of womanhood is very important to me. This is a struggle, how a woman sees herself, defines herself. In the culture that we live in, it is particularly <clears throat> difficult. Today we're looking at three central tenets or truths, three big ideas. And this is merely or uh, only laying the groundwork or building a frame on which the next, uh, the following five weeks discussions will be placed. So today I'm not going to answer uh, a lot of the really hot button issues uh, that I will be answering over the next five weeks. Now, I want to give a brief warning. Again, we're just laying the groundwork today. I want to give a brief warning. Here's a, here's, a, here's a hurdle that every one of us has to clear. First, we have to clear the one that I already spoke of, and that is we have to get our minds out of this mindset that I'm just physical. What people see, how they perceive me with their eyes, that's me. That, defines, that by definition is me. We have to clear that hurdle. Here's another hurdle that we have to clear, which is a little bit more nebulous and a little more broad. The hurdle is this. Many of the things that, that you reject, um, the things which you're passionately against, and, and many of the things which you believe you you hold firmly to you are most passionate 
about. And we all have those things, the things that we are expressly against and the things that we are expressly for. Many of the things that you are for and against, you and, and, and I as well, you have not researched for yourself, but rather you've adopted your beliefs because of cultural pressure, because of social media noise. My goal, my desire is that we, at the end of the six weeks, we would have a studied opinion on this topic. That we would have a, a, a biblically grounded opinion on this topic. As I said, every one of us in this room, there are, th there are matters in which we have merely adopted uh, what culture has told us, or we read one book and we have, we have determined wholeheartedly to, to believe that. It might be, it might be uh, I'm going to give you some very innocuous examples and some, some pretty, pretty serious, maybe even maddening sort of examples, but I, I want to I jar you a little bit. You know, maybe, maybe you'd say, you know, you, someone told you that you heard that the new international version of the Bible, it now uses uh, some uh, inclusive language. Not about God, not, not about Jesus, but it might say, for instance, rather than brothers, it might say brothers and sisters, which within the original Greek language, talking about the New Testament. That's perfectly acceptable. If you, anyway, you may have heard that, and you might have said, oh, well, so, so someone told me, so therefore I believe that the NIV, they sold out, right? They gone soft. Um, or or maybe, maybe you read one book, and you've determined that, that um, anyone in the United States, anyway, that is, that, that, that is wholeheartedly for social justice is actually a Marxist. Or anyone that is, that is for, uh, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is on, you know, Team Donald Trump is a fascist. And you read one book and you've decided that to, to just adopt someone else's opinion for yourself, but you really, really don't have a studied thought on the issue. You might say, well, <clears throat> pro-lifers, they hate ladies. Uh, Pro-choice people, they hate babies. Uh, or you might say, you know, I've heard somewhere that God thinks that, that, that men are more valuable or more capable leaders than women. There's so many thoughts that we embrace that we never stopped to study. I want for us on the topic of womanhood to have a studied opinion at the end of this six weeks. So here we go, three big ideas on which everything else is going to be built. Number one, woman, you are inherently valuable in God's eyes. Inherently, I want to even, I, I even want to unpack that word briefly. Inherently valuable, what I mean by that, I wrote this down, existing as a permanent, essential characteristic of who you are in your womanhood. You are inherently, permanently, essentially valuable in God's eyes. But not based on your physical self. Not based on your ranking in this physical world. Not, not based on how you measure up. Remember, one day, this body of yours, it will be shed. It will be sloughed off. And this physical existence as we know it will cease to exist. And your degrees or your lack of degrees, your resume or lack of a resume will fall by the wayside. And you will continue to thrive as a person you are inherently valuable. How do women come into existence? Do you remember? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2 verse 26. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind, this is the NIV, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. 
so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Woman, you are not an afterthought. You are not a helper. You were made in God's image. You you are a creator. You create people. Woman, you have dignity and value and worth. You are a child of the living God. You are not inherently valuable on or according to some metric that takes into account what men think of you. You are not not inherently valuable according to some metric that takes into account how helpful you are to men or how you relate to men. You are an image bearer of the living God. You are created in God's image. Galatians chapter 3 says this, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all in, all one in Christ Jesus. Okay, so what does that mean? That, that in Christ, we are neither male nor female. Obviously, in, the, in this physical existence, we continue to operate, to, func- to function with our, unique gen- with our unique genders, our unique uh, uh, racial characteristics. What does it mean that in Christ, there is neither male nor female? It means that in Christ, there is no division into male and female. That is, we all have a common relationship with Christ Jesus. Let me say that again. We all have a common relationship with Christ Jesus. So I am, I am sorry, not for what the Bible says about gender. We're going to talk about that. But I am sorry that the church has in some ways over the last several decades, lied to us about this topic. What I mean by that is that the, the, the church over the last, I, I can only go back 50 years because I'm 50 years old. The, the church has adopted in my lifetime mostly a cultural view on gender issues rather than taking a theological position, a biblical position on gender issues. That might surprise you when I say that, especially if you're a conservative theologian like me, and especially if you've been in the same churches that I've been in, you might say, how is that, Randy? Here's how that is. Let's just paint a scenario and say in the 70s, a, a man uh, who uh, let's just paint a picture of a middle-aged man who goes to church and is uh, he, he's nominally uh, invested in in the church, but he would say he would say that he he believes the Bible. He may not really know the Bible, but he would say he he believes the Bible. He he may not really know the Bible, but he would say he's conservative in how he views the Bible, which he mostly doesn't know. And there was a day, because culture would support this, there was a day where that gentleman could say, well, a woman is to be at home and to submit to her husband and, you know, pregnant and barefoot. And and, and yet that person would have no biblical context whatsoever, but would merely fall back on a cultural tendency toward misogyny. 
and believe that, you know, somewhere I heard, I heard somewhere that in the Bible it calls women to stay at home, and so that's what I believe because I believe the Bible. But we want to know what are God's thoughts on womanhood? What does the Bible really say about womanhood? If you grow up in the church, then there is a, there's a pretty good chance that as a child uh, and as a young woman, you were taught that if you wanted to please God and, and, and you wanted to please culture, then your place was secondary and your role was supportive. Here's the problem. Culture has moved on. <laughs> culture has moved on to a no less demeaning a theologically ignorant expectation of women. But culture has moved on. And so now the church is stuck in limbo. So now if the church does not have their thoughts on womanhood grounded in, in God's thoughts on womanhood, we are irrelevant in this discussion. What does it mean? In Christ, there is neither male nor female. It means that in God's eyes, men and women are equal. As God is redeeming His creation in heaven, heaven, it's sometimes called the new creation. As God is redeeming his creation, misogyny is being defeated and will one day be completely defeated in God's kingdom. The social and political advantages of being a male in the patriarchal culture that Jesus lived in and that we live in, those social and political advantages are now available to all in God's new creation. You, woman, are made in God's image. Now today is merely a, a 30,000 foot flyover. Uh, it's, 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 we, we don't have time to unpack everything fully. We will do that over the next five weeks. But for now, we need to move on. Big idea number two. Every single person bears the image of God. The Latin term, which is the theological term that you'll hear theologians use all the time, uh, is imago dei. It's simply Latin for uh, the image of God, that we are image bearers. God said, let us make mankind in our image. And then he created us, male and female, in his image. Okay, I will now address one of the most controversial issues in our culture in summer of 2022. As you know, a few weeks ago... Um, Roe was, was overturned by the Supreme Court, uh, which means that no longer are we a country that, 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 is, that has determined that abortion is a legal right. Um, and I was, I was actually in Kansas City. I was actually in a prayer room in Kansas City. Uh, well, to be exact, I was in the coffee shop next to the prayer room when I received word Hey, Dad, the Supreme Court just overturned Roe v. Wade. And I went into a prayer room, into a prayer, um, to a worship scenario where there was a lot of emotion. There was a lot of, uh, of a really raw emotion regarding this issue. And I want to address this issue with you right now by using a phrase that it... Uh, a phrase, the, the phrase, and I think it's, I think it's a good one. Some, some have co-opted this phrase, but I like it nonetheless. The phrase is, a consistent ethic of life. 
which simply means that all life is precious. All life is precious. Here's why this might be a stretch for you. To hold to the, 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 the truth, the biblical ethic that, that all life is precious, to hold to the biblical ethic that, that every person that has ever been born of man is created in God's image. We are image bearers. In some way, we image or look like God. The reason that's a stretch for some is to embrace this, that all life is precious, um, has everything to do with how we view. I'll just give you a list. How we view the incarcerated black man on death row. How we view the value of the dementia-stricken elderly person maybe in your care right now. How we view uh, the, the value of the young lady who is trafficked and abused. How we view the unborn baby in the womb and how we view the, the mama who's carrying that baby. A Christian ethic, a Christian truth in the Old Testament and the New Testament that we are to hold to, if in fact we are Christ's followers. The Christian ethic is this. When faced with an ethical or moral decision as Christians, we favor and promote and highly value human life in all forms. Let me say that again. A Christian ethic. That when we are faced with, a, with an ethical or a moral decision, we, we favor, we tend toward, we promote and highly value human life. I just think that comes naturally, not just for us Christian, as Christians, but even non-Christians. I believe that this just, the human spirit is such that we favor, we tend toward life. Now, you may say, well, I don't see that culturally, Randy, but, but I really do. I believe that generally speaking, we tend toward or favor. So I don't believe that those who I'm going to say things this over the next six weeks that are going to madden you, but you have to listen closely to my words. I don't believe that those who favor abortions hate babies or hate life and love death. They don't believe that life begins at conception. I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. When we as, when we as humanity, when we see life, I believe every one of us, we value life. I mean, those of us that are sane, and that's why it's an important issue, this, image of the, this issue of the image of God born out in every human being. That's why it's important because once we as human beings, we see life, I believe we highly value life. Years ago, 20-something years ago, I took a, a motorcycle uh, uh, training class in New, in, in New Mexico because it would get my insurance down. And I've been a motorcycle rider for a long time. And I was taught in that class over 20 years ago, I was taught that, that listen, the, the, the instructor said, listen, you riders, um, if a person sees, if, if, a, if, a, if a motorist, somebody driving a car, sees you on a motorcycle, they will avoid you in favor of striking another car or striking a median or striking some other inanimate object. The, the issue is they need to see you and they need to determine that you are an actual living being. But if they see you, they will swerve to miss you and hit, hit a brick wall. They, but, but, it, but they need to know that you're there and know that you're human. Now, why is this important? Because, again, I just believe, maybe I have more faith in the human soul than you do, but I, I just believe that, that when we inherently see life, we, uh, when we see life, inherently we value life. So cutting to the chase... The question is, where does life begin? 
And I would go back to first the, the Genesis passage and say that every one of us, we bear the imago Dei, the image of God. We're image bearers of God. When does that begin? When is that fetus a baby? I'm so tired of the noise. Uh, I'm so tired of the, the, the idea that, 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 that to, to favor the baby, you have to oppress the woman. To, to favor the woman, you have to oppress the baby. How does God see the baby in the mother's womb? Psalm 139. Listen to this beautiful poetry. For you created my inmost being. God, you, you, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. You, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Listen, folks, this is how God saw you in the womb before you were ever born. God saw you in your mother's womb. He, he saw you before you lived out and in a single day, He already saw what you were to be, what was to come to be. Psalm 22 says this, From birth I was cast on you, Get this, from my mother's womb, you have been my God. The personhood of a little baby in, in the womb before he, she has ever been born. What's the point? I realize there are so many complex issue, issues around abortion. But that little person in the womb is an image bearer of God. Now, I have heard the very real stories of women who fear that a lack of access to abortions will, will, will put a woman who is already miscarried at risk if she can't get the health care she needs. We must realize, the church, we must realize that that mom who is a and in a, in a hard place, that mom, she is an image bearer of God. This is not an issue of, of, of which we can afford uh, <clears throat> to pit one against the other, the, the health of the woman against the, the health of the baby. We cannot afford that sort of, of gamble or, or, or game. Unfortunately, some of the noise that has come out of the, 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 the political aspect of this, of this issue. And, and I am staunchly, staunchly pro-life. Unfortunately, some of the noise that has come out of that camp, from the, 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 the political vein of that camp, um, some of the noise coming out is using this precious issue for political clout have made the health and the dignity of the woman seeking an abortion seemingly a second matter. And for that, I'm sorry. To be pro-life demands that we care that in over three of every four abortions, poverty is a significant issue. To, to be pro-life as a Christian, demands that we care that approximately 85% of abortions occur um, when the mom is single, alone. You can check me on those statistics. The dignity and value and worth of the unborn does not supersede the dignity, value, and worth of the mother. Neither does it pale in comparison. Uh, other places in the, in the New Testament uh, that, that, that speak of how the unborn are depicted. In Luke chapter 1, 
of John the Baptist, it says, and he was, get this, filled with the Holy Spirit even before he was born. Jeremiah 1.5, it seems to be that we can have some sort of knowledge, awareness, relationship with God prior to even being born. Before I, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. So we speak up for the unborn as, as the church, and we, we care for mothers and families. The goal of the church is not to win political battles, but to make disciples. Everyone in this room, you are handcrafted by God. In, in, in contrast to how culture defines you, this is how God sees you as uniquely handcrafted, an image bearer of God. We, the church, have a special obligation to care for precious, vulnerable ones who die without our help. And that includes others besides just the unborn. Let me say that again. We, the church, have an obligation to care for precious, vulnerable persons who would die without our help, and that includes others besides just the unborn. That is a consistent ethic of life. Third point. Woman, you are distinct in God's eyes. And this is where the next five weeks will really be grounded and settled. The the distinctness, the distinctness that is you as a woman. The uniqueness of who you are. There is a distinctive sense to being a woman. Think on this. Every human that has ever been born, every person that has ever become a person, every human that has ever been born has been born of a woman. Think on that. Let that sink in. I actually was struck by that a few weeks ago when I heard Dave Chappelle, the comedian Dave Chappelle, say that. He, he used very different words, but he, he, he made that same point that every human being has ever come into existence has come from a woman. Said another way, woman, you are made not just to bear the image of God, but to bear the image of God in a unique, distinct way. There was a distinctness to woman in the Garden of Eden. As an image bearer of God, there is something about your womanhood that is distinct. It distinctly bears God's image in ways that we men can never achieve. Something in you that is just like God and unique and distinct in your womanhood. There's something about your womanhood that, that reflects God's image that I, as a man, I cannot reflect. Rest in that. There was a distinct role given to Eve, the mother of the human race, as a distinct role that, that Adam could not fill. You were honored in God's sight. You were honored in your distinctness as a woman in God's sight, apart from your physical self. Jesus honored women distinctly in a very countercultural way. Jesus had a very deep, personal, 
non-sexual friendship with women. Just a few examples with, with two sisters, Mary and Martha. They were some of his closest friends. He would go there on the weekends for a meal and a place to hang out along with their, their brother, Lazarus. They seemed to get him. He's, Jesus seemed to get them. Uh, Jesus had female disciples who traveled in his large group of learners who were a, a significant part of his ministry. How he dealt with, going back to John 4, how he dealt with the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well, with such dignity. She said to him, how is it that you, a Jewish man, are speaking openly and publicly to me, a Samaritan woman? Because in the patriarchal, misogynist culture that they lived in, Jesus should not be doing that. In Luke chapter 8, there's good evidence that Jesus, his ministry was funded um, by, by women who had wealth. I'm just going to read it to you. We're not going to project it. We'll probably look at this again in coming weeks. After this, this Luke 8, you can look it up later or look it on your phone if you brought your Bible. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. Listen to this. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. Another way of translating that into English would, would be that these women, with their own finance, finances, were supporting the ministry of Jesus and his 12 apostles during his three years of, <clears throat> of, of ministry. Womanhood. Think on this. When all the male disciples fled the cross, Jesus' women, uh, Jesus women disciples were still there. We have, we, have, we have no reason to believe other than all, ele- all the other d- disciples besides John fled, left at the foot of the cross were John and Jesus' women disciples. What is my point here? Is it to bash men? No, of course not. Uh, my, my point here is to say that in Jesus' eyes, the dignity, value, and worth of a woman was, was, was esteemed. Jesus saw dignity in women and looked them in the eye and, and treated them as friends to the degree that, that others in his day accused him of sleeping with them. Because why was that? Because they had no category, the culture around Jesus had no category for a man who didn't sexualize and demean and talk down to women. But that was their problem because Jesus, in a very patriarchal culture, Jesus was radically countercultural in how he treated women. So we're going to wrap this up for today. Those are the three big ideas on which the rest of this series will rest. Woman, I want you to walk out of here today with the sense that you are distinct. You are unique. If if you never have a child, you never have a husband, that does not rob you of your distinctness. You are woman. You you needn't be married. Now, statistically, most of you, like 90% of you, will marry, so we're going to address that over the next five weeks. But, But that is not an obligation in order to be pleasing to the Lord. You are free 
to live independently as a new creation in Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old patriarchal way of viewing your worth is gone. The old is gone. You are a unique or a new creation in Christ. Okay. You're unique, you're distinct, and the next five weeks, starting next Sunday, will be devoted to that. We're going to unpack that. How are you distinctly woman? How are you uniquely woman? How, what does that look like? How is that unique and distinct in God's eyes? And we're going to talk about it. I'm going to answer a bunch of questions. By the way, I've got, I'm going to answer one question today. Take your connection card. This will make it anonymous because we don't fingerprint these things. Take your card, and if you have a question but you don't want to like, want me to know that you're answering the question, that's fine. Maybe you do want me to know. But if you would write down a question, put it on your connection card, put it in the offering basket when it comes by in about 10 minutes, then um, I, over the next five weeks, are going to answer your question. I'm going to answer one today. Um, but over the next, over the next five weeks, we're going to deal, think, we're going to deal with these issues. Um, should I, as a woman, should I get married? We're going to deal with your desire to be a wife, or maybe your lack of desire to be a wife. We're going to deal with your desire to be a mom, or your, your lack of desire to be a mom. We're going to deal with um, the issue, should, should women work? Should women be supervising men? We're going to talk about the office of elder in the church. We're going to talk about uh, women pastors, and then some of you are going to hate me, and some of you are going to maybe love me. Uh, we're going to talk about hot button issues. We're going to talk about male headship which is a, I know it sounds weird, right? It's a biblical truth. It's in Scripture. We affirm it, but what does it mean? Male headship. We're going to end with a really, really, right off from the bat, we got like a hard, hard question, and we're going to, I'm going to partially answer it today. Here it is. And then we're going to run to the table of communion because we need Jesus on this and every topic. Every week I'm going to do this. You've got to turn in your questions, though, or else I'm going to have to make up questions. This actually came from a River Church uh, member. I need your questions. Put them, on the, put them on the connection card. Here it is. Right out of the gate. What is the best way to talk to someone from a biblical perspective, who is questioning or having confusion about gender identity or experiencing gender dysphoria, especially young people. All right. Um, so first of all, the first thing I would say to them is, hey, would you come to church with me starting next week for five weeks? That's the first thing I would say, um, because we're going to be talking about this a lot. The next thing that I want to say is that um, something that I think that the church is really um, missing, missing um, the mark on is I believe that the church is attempting to instill morality on a lost and dying culture as like the next best thing to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Which is really backwards when you think about it. We're, we're, we're expecting spiritually dead people to somehow in zombie-like fashion act as though they're living when they are, in fact, spiritually, and I don't mean this in a, in a demeaning way, but spiritually, they are dead. So, 
So, so my expectation um, that a person would, would follow the ways that, that God has called us to live in order that we might thrive as Christ followers, um, that expectation I, I place on us as believers. I, 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 don't, I don't first and foremost attempt to... Um, Place my moral expectations on people that are not believers. Now, we've got a, we've got a, a person, a young person, who is, um, I think the word was confused, um, asking questions, wondering. In compassion, I would say to that person, I love you. I want you to thrive as a human being. I don't know that you're thriving right now. I mean, it's hard to thrive in the midst of confusion and questioning. I would love to help you walk through this issue. And if you'd like to know what the Bible says about God, the creator of the universe, how he has designed us as, as people, then I would love to, to, walk, to, walk, to walk through that with you. Uh, not so that I can impose my beliefs on you, but so that I can help you establish and determine your own beliefs. Again, I, would, I really would. I wasn't just joking. I would say, hey, you know, at, at church, we're talking about this over the next five weeks, and Pastor Randy, he's, he's, he's a really loving guy. He's, he's, he's not a judgmental guy. You should come and just maybe hear what he has to say about this. I'll end with this. I know this is a, slight, this is a different topic, to some degree, but I think there's some relevance here, so I'll end with this. One of the things that we're going to talk about over the next five weeks, gender, womanhood, um, I've already said, it's, it's unique, it's well-defined, it's, it's distinct, as is manhood. But this, is, this sermon series isn't about manhood. Maybe we'll do one of those later. It's, Womanhood, distinct, unique, defined. Um, but the question that I want us to wrestle with over the next five weeks, at least one of the, one of the Sundays, is this. Femininity, femininity, is there, is there a spectrum? Is there a scale? And, and I think this has some relevance to young people struggling with their own gender issues. It may not be a gender issue at all. Again, let me just say this. Womanhood, distinct. You are distinctly female. Unless you're a man, then you're distinctly... It's distinct, but, but femininity in the construct of how God has designed us, I believe to be less exact. Yeah, if I can say this, there is a flexible, variable nature to femininity. And I think that's under the lordship of Christ. I think that is good and right in how God created you as a woman. Uh, some more feminine, some less feminine. So there's freedom in Christ, for instance, to, to wear a dress because that makes you feel distinctly who you are. And there's freedom within Christ to wear pants, for instance. Uh, freedom to marry Freedom to remain single your entire life. Freedom to be the president of the bank. Freedom to be the president of the, the, the parent-teacher organization where your kids go to school. And we're going to talk more about that. But within the distinctness of womanhood, there's also a lot of flexibility. Oh, that, oh, that we may be led to think the thoughts of God as found in Scripture on this topic over the, the next six weeks. Let's pray. God, we want to think your thoughts. We are appropriately um, humbled and in awe today of how you have, have made us, how you've created us. I pray that, um, I used this word earlier, and I'll, I'll use it again. I pray that as a result of this sermon series, that we more and more as, as men and as women 
we more and more would learn how to th thrive, how to thrive in our existence. Women here would learn how to thrive as women, to really enjoy all that you have for them as, as women. May, may, that, may that happen. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.